good afternoon and welcome back to the neonatal lecture series i hope you went through my first lecture which i delivered two weeks back on neonatal jaundice so today the topic for discussion is neonatal sepsis and uh, we will see what are the objectives of this lecture neonatal, neonatal sepsis as well as neonatal jaundice are two common problems which newborns encounter in our day to day pra uh, practice so we will go to the objectives of the lesson first so at the end of the lecture you should be able to list the etiological agents of newborn sepsis and you should be able to categorize neonatal sepsis according to onset site and severity number 3 you have to identify clinical features of neonatal sepsis and identify the risk factors for sepsis number 5 describe investigation and treatment of sepsis and finally discuss what are the prevention methods which are available for uh, neonatal sepsis so why learn about neonatal sepsis uh, we learn about neonatal sepsis because it is uh, uh, because the commonest age group affected by sepsis is the neonatal period so during this first 28 days of life uh, newborns are affected with sepsis more than any other uh, children of any other age group and there is a very high mortality and morbidity due to neonatal sepsis the other problem is neonatal sepsis have vague signs and symptoms especially of early sepsis vague signs and symptoms means the signs are very non specific therefore there is a very high chance of missing a diagnosis if you are not aware of these signs and symptoms and the causative organisms when compared to the older child and adult is different in neonates but the most important thing is neonatal sepsis is preventable so a uh, few definitions which you need to know sepsis means systemic inflammatory response syndrome or sirs okay systemic inflammatory response syndrome due to an infection and the word septicemia is used when there is sepsis due to an identified pathogen cultured from the blood and septic shock means severe circulatory insufficiency with tissue hypoperfusion due to severe sepsis despite adequate fluid resuscitation and cardiac function because in a child with sepsis you might go into hypovolemic shock that is not septic shock or we, you might run into cardiogenic shock due to the sepsis uh, so, so septic shock means when the fluid resuscitation has occurred there is no hypovolemia there, there is good cardiac function still the child goes into circulatory insufficiency and tissue hyperperfusion then you can call it septic shock otherwise the other type of two shocks should be called as hypovolemic shock associated with sepsis or cardiogenic shock associated with sepsis mm -hmm. then why neonatal sepsis is common neonatal sepsis is common because of two major problems which the newborn has to face Number one, it has a very weakened natural barrier function. Our natural barriers are skin, blood brain barrier and gut mucosa. But unfortunately in neonates, all these three barriers are very immature. The skin is immature, blood brain barrier is immature and the gut mucosa is immature. And organisms usually enter us mainly through the skin and the gut mucosa. And if you do not have a proper natural barrier, you might run into trouble with sepsis. Uh, gut mucosa evolves with time. So the, uh, the barrier functions of the gut mucosa evolves with time. So when a newborn is born, it has a very mature gut mucosa. It becomes mature only with time. Uh, medical students living in mass hall will know what I, what I mean. If you can go through the, um, go through one year, while residing in mass hall and eating from the canteen and have only about one or two uh, diarrheal infections that means you have a very highly functioning 
natural gut mucosal barrier. Okay, but unfortunately, neonates have a very low functioning gut mucosal barrier. Then the cellular and humoral immunity is also weakened in neonates. So the neonates have phagocytes, but they are or neutrophils but their phagocytic capacity is very low. They have a bone marrow but the bone marrow capacity to respond to sepsis is again reduced. Their T cell and B cell functions are also reduced and they have a very low level of preformed antibodies. So all these factors, all these natural barriers and cellular and humoral immunity weaknesses all contribute to sepsis in the newborn. The causative organisms, it depends on whether the sepsis is early sepsis or late sepsis. And early sepsis is sepsis occurring during the first 48 to 72 hours or during the first 2 to 3 days of life. Any sepsis occurring after day 4 of life is called late sepsis. So early sepsis, usually the causative organisms are organisms found in mother's GIT or mother's genitourinary tract because it is obvious any early sepsis the organism should or, or organism almost always come from the mother but early sepsis can occur due to organisms which enters the uh, newborn ex utero or once the child leaves the uterus late sepsis again it can be due to organisms found in mother's GUT or GIT but uh, sometimes germs living in the newborn skin or the caregiver's skin or caregivers may be the mother, the hospital staff, relatives, those organisms also can come and affect the newborn. That's why we always recommend minimum relatives or minimum visitors to a newborn unit or even to a newborn who is staying at home. The lesser amount of visitors lesser amount of sepsis. Then the organisms which are causing early newborn sepsis are usually group B streptococcus which lives in the mother's upper, upper vagina and rectum. E. coli mainly who lives in mother's gastrointestinal system. Staph epidermidis and Listeria monocytogenes. The organisms causing late sepsis is E. coli, Klebsiella and Serratia, Enterobacter, all are GIT related organisms, Staph epidermitis, Staph aureus, Pseudomonas and anaerobes. Rare organisms which can cause newborn sepsis include Candida, Clostridium difficile and Acinetobacter. If you see rare organisms affecting a newborn, you have to always suspect and underlying immunodeficiency status in the newborn. Their natural immunity is anyway deficient, but some children might be having a genetically trans, uh, you know, uh, genetically transmitted immunodeficiency syndrome or immunodeficiency condition. Then they can be affected with these rare organisms. Then there are risk factors for sepsis. So there are certain factors which act as risk factors for sepsis. The risk factors for early sepsis include prolonged rupture of membranes, especially more than 18 hours because when the membranes are ruptured before delivery, the natural barrier caused by the membranes are lost and organisms in the mother's upper vagina can go through the ruptured membrane and attack the child. Prematurity obviously is a risk factor because premature children have very weakened immune system compared to a term baby. Maternal fever during early labor means mother is infected with some kind of an organism and that same organism can also affect the fetus. Smelly lyco and especially smelly lyco with low abdominal pain in the mother is another risk factor because it suggests chorioamnionitis. Instrumental delivery, too many per vaginal examinations are again risk factor, especially in uh, tertiary care hospitals where a lot of medical students are doing examinations. If you are not careful, you can be uh, another cause for uh, neonatal sepsis. Maternal UTI, 
extensive resuscitation at birth because there will be too many people handling the child and again the baby is exposed to septic agents. Poor socioeconomic state and maternal hygiene again is a risk factor and maternal obesity or gestational diabetes mellitus are other recognized uh, risk factors for sepsis. Then risk factors for late sepsis include again prematurity and poor hygiene especially for skin sepsis. Poor hygiene means hygiene of the baby as well as the caregiver. Presence of cannula, central venous lines and UVCs, umbilical vein catheters. If the child is on a mechanical ventilator for a prolonged time, the ventilator associated sepsis can occur and prolonged hospital stay because hospital is full of organisms and these hospital acquired infections or nosocomial sepsis can affect any newborn. That's why we always try to discharge a newborn as soon as it recovers from any medical condition. Then clinical features mostly are non-specific and very subtle. Subtle means they sometimes they are missed because they the symptoms are not very uh, prominent. Okay. So many other conditions or complications can have the same features which occur in sepsis. For example, children with respiratory distress syndrome can have tachypnea. Sepsis, a child with sepsis also can have tachypnea. But a child with respiratory distress syndrome can also have tachypnea, but not without having sepsis. Intracranial hemorrhage, hypothermia, feeding failure, inborn errors of metabolism, and hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. All these uh, problems or complications in neonates can have the same features which occur in neonatal sepsis. So, what are the signs and symptoms? We will divide these signs and symptoms according to the systems. So, respiratory system, tachypnea, apnea and grunting. Grunting is always a danger sign because grunting means there is a pathology in the alveolar level. Then cardiovascular system, circulatory failure and tachycardia, gastrointestinal uh, tract, Symptoms will be poor feeding, vomiting, abdominal distension. Metabolic symptoms include hypoglycemia or sometimes hyperglycemia. Fever but more commonly hypothermia. So in a neonate if there is recurrent hypothermia you have to suspect sepsis. The central nervous system symptoms include irritability, lethargy and seizures. The miscellaneous uh, symptoms could be mottled skin. Or abnormal cry. So, but if you go through this this uh, list of signs and symptoms, you will see that none of them are very specific for sepsis. Each and every sign or symptom can occur in any other condition which the newborn is affecting, other than sepsis. Then the clinical manifestation as a group can be divided into several diagnoses. Uh, one diagnosis we give commonly is a condition called presumed sepsis. That means in a newborn initial signs are suggestive of sepsis but when you investigate the neonate no further conclusive evidence develop over time. So initially a newborn might look like having sepsis. He might have some of the features which we discussed in the previous slide. But when you do blood test and investigate, everything comes as normal. And the child also does not progress any other symptoms over time. Then we call it, it's a presumed sepsis. Not a confirmed sepsis, but only a presumed sepsis. But then sometimes some children will have clinical features and investigation. Suggestive of sepsis, but without a focal sign. We don't know where the infection is. We only know that there is an infection, but we can't find the focus. Then that type of sepsis is called non-specific sepsis. Septicemia is obviously sepsis with organism cultured from blood. Then sepsis with localization, where you can identify or you can uh, identify a focus of sepsis. For example, skin sepsis, umbilical sepsis. Congenital pneumonia, where the focus is in the lung. 
necrotizing enterocolitis focuses in the gastrointestinal system meningitis or ophthalmia neonatarum then a little bit of pneumonia congenital pneumonia is usually due to aspiration of pathogens during birth and sometimes organism may enter neonatal lungs in utero and therefore the baby is born in an ill status postnatal pneumonia is mainly occurring in newborns receiving ventilatory support or they can get the pneumonia from a caregiver this postnatal pneumonia these children with postnatal pneumonia usually are normal at birth later on they develop signs and symptoms of respiratory distress the meningitis uh, there are few mcqs which you can try and answer uh, early onset meningitis exhibit neurological clinical signs in majority of cases you can post the presentation here and try to answer then i will give you the answers now one by one so early onset meningitis exhibit neurological clinical signs in majority of cases the answer is false early onset meningitis does not exhibit neurological clinical signs sometimes there will be no signs or no symptoms of neurological involvement despite having meningitis so you don't wait for neurological signs to appear you have to investigate if you suspect meningitis question number 2 lumbar puncture should be considered in any newborn with severe sepsis the answer is true if a newborn has severe sepsis even if the child does not have neurological signs you still have to consider lumbar puncture okay number 3 meningitis should be considered even if a very ill neonate has a clear focus at another site for example there is a, a newborn with severe sepsis with a congenital pneumonia but the child is severely ill do you do lumbar puncture or do you perform lumbar puncture or suspect meningitis the answer is true yes in a older child if you have a clear focus you don't have to suspect meningitis but you treat the focus but in neonates even if there is one focus still it's better to suspect meningitis because newborns can have several focus when they are severely ill last question meningitis can be present even when csf analysis is normal the answer is true yes sometimes early meningitis the csf will be normal or in viral meningitis the csf sample might look completely normal management so neonatal sepsis can kill a newborn within hours so this means you have to act quickly if you suspect meningitis and the most important step in management is early antibiotic as soon as sepsis is suspected you don't wait for the investigation results you start antibiotics early and treatment should not be delayed unnecessarily by waiting for investigation result if the newborn is completely healthy looking yes you might wait for the investigation but if the newborn is ill you don't unnecessarily wait you start antibiotics after sending investigations the unique feature in newborn care is sometimes antibiotics are started when significant risk factors are present in a newborn even if the baby is asymptomatic a full blood count crp and a blood culture performed and antibiotics are started for example say there is a newborn who looks very well active and healthy but he has a history of no oh, not he the mother has a history of prolonged rupture of membrane for 48 hours so that's a one risk factor and the mother is having gestational diabetes mellitus that's a second risk factor and the obstetrician confirms that during the delivery mother had very offensive smelly lyco so three risk factors so we have three risk factors prolonged rupture of membrane smelly lyco and mother having gestational diabetes mellitus then in this situation because there is two or more than two risk factors present 
then even if the newborn looks normal we have to do a partial septic screen that is full blood count crp blood culture and start antibiotics but after 48 hours if full blood count crp and blood culture is negative and the baby remains normal then you can stop the antibiotics and say okay the baby had risk factors but does not have an infection the other thing, important thing in newborn care is although early antibiotics are recommended, once the risk of sepsis is excluded, antibiotics should be discontinued as soon as possible in order to prevent antibiotic resistance. The investigations in newborn sepsis are fourfold. One, you do blood investigations. Uh, uncommonly or rarely we do urine uh, investigations. Imaging and CSF investigations are done only in severe sepsis. So the commonly done investigations include a full blood count where WBC in a usual normal newborn, the usual count is 8000 to 20,000. They usually have higher counts than normal children. And unlike in children, in adult or older children, all the children have a predominantly lymphocytic count, but newborns will have a predominantly neutrophilic count. Their neutrophil count will be higher than in older children. The platelets are usually above 100,000. In neonatal sepsis, we see leukopenia or low WBC and neutropenia more commonly than raised counts. So if we see a newborn with clinical features of sepsis and a WBC of 3,000, Yes, you have to strongly suspect sepsis. In sepsis, they also get thrombocytopenia. It's very common for newborns to get thrombocytopenia during sepsis. The CRP or C-reactive protein can increase within few hours after the onset of sepsis. And usually in our setup, we do two C-reactive proteins, at least two CRP, so C-reactive proteins before we exclude sepsis. So we do two C-reactive proteins over a period of say 24 hours and there is no rise in CRP, then we can safely say the evidence for sepsis is less or minimum. Blood culture is the most useful investigation in sepsis. It's the most useful investigation to exclude sepsis rather than confirm sepsis because sometimes blood not sometimes, all the time, blood culture will take some time to uh, get give results, at least 24 hours. We can't wait for 24 hours to start antibiotics. So what we do is we send blood for culture and start antibiotics. If the blood culture is negative, yes, we can safely say, oh, the child is not having sepsis, but... Remember, if a newborn is having clinical signs and symptoms of sepsis, even if the blood culture is negative, still it is okay to continue antibiotics based on clinical suspicion. The CSF normal parameters in a child more than one month compared to a neonate, there are a lot of differences. In an older child, WBC will be less than 5, but in a neonate, it will be less than 20. So up to 20 WBC is considered normal in a neonate. Neutrophils will be 0% in uh, older children. That means we don't expect neutrophils in the CSF sample. But in neonate, 10 to 20% of neutrophils can be there. The protein content in a normal older child should be less than 40 mg per deciliter. But in a neonate, it may be up to about 120 mg per deciliter. In premature babies, it can go even up to 150 mg per deciliter. So anything above 150 will be taken as positive in a premature newborn. The sugar difference, CSF sugar should be about more than 60% of RBC, uh, of sorry, RBS or random blood sugar. In units, it is same. So there is no difference between the sugar percentage in between old child and a neonate. Imaging include chest x-ray and ultrasound scan of the brain. Swabs include skin swabs, umbilical swabs, eye and ear swabs. And urine uh, investigations mainly involve in, includes a urine culture. 
so treatment if you suspect sepsis and the results are still awaiting the empirical antibiotic which can be used is penicillin and gentamicin we use penicillin and gentamicin because penicillin is ideal for group B streptococcus because it is universally sensitive to penicillin and gentamicin is good for GIT organisms mainly E. coli so because group B streptococcus and E. coli are the most common organisms by giving penicillin and gentamicin we are emphatically covering those organisms in a neonate less than 7 days the above antibiotics are given as 12 hourly intervals now in older children penicillin is given 6 hourly but not in neonates in neonates more than 7 days penicillin is converted to 8 hourly dosing but if you are suspecting meningitis you can't give gentamicin because it does not cross the blood brain barrier therefore gentamicin is replaced by kefotaxin Keftriaxone is a very nice drug because it is given only once a day. Ideally, it should be okay for neonates, but unfortunately, keftriaxone cannot be used in neonate because it can cause fatal reaction if given with calcium containing IV drips. And newborns always are on drips which contains calcium. So, it is avoided. Keftriaxone is avoided. And keftriaxone in neonates can sometimes cause conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. If you are using aminoglycosides like gentamicin or amicacin, you have to ideally check the blood levels regularly and monitor. And the doses should be changed accordingly because aminoglycosides are autotoxic. They can be toxic to the in, uh, ear or they can cause sensory neural hearing damage and aminoglycosides are also toxic to the kidney. There is a nephrotoxic effect. So if you monitor the blood levels and change the doses accordingly, those harmful effects can be minimized. Antibiotic duration, presumed sepsis. Presume sepsis means you suspect sepsis but all investigations normal and baby is clinically normal. Then if you can obtain the blood culture result by 36 hours or at least by 48 hours and if the blood culture is also negative you stop antibiotics at 36 to 48 hours. So presume sepsis you start antibiotics but the baby looks clinically normal continue to look normal afterwards investigations including full blood count crp blood culture uh, comes as normal then there is no point continuing the antibiotic you stop it ideally at 36 hours or at least at 48 hours that is to prevent unnecessary continuing of antibiotics if you start antibiotics for risk factors but investigations are normal right uh, the mother has some risk factors for sepsis you start antibiotics on the baby but all investigations come no as normal then again you can start stop antibiotics at 48 hours if there is sepsis but without any specific localization five days is enough if you have a septicemia you can continue antibiotics up to seven to ten days but in both these situations, if the child remains clinically ill at the end of this recommended antibiotic duration, the clinician has the right to continue it further for another say three to four days extra until the baby becomes clinically uh, normal. Meningitis, if you sus or if you culture group B streptococcus in your CSF sample. 10 to 14 days is enough but if there are other organisms 21 days is enough group B streptococcus although it's a very serious organism it's very susceptible to the antibiotics therefore 10 to 14 days is enough then prevention prevention of sepsis uh, you can start antenatally you can screen and treat infections in mum like group B streptococcus herpes simplex virus and UTIs. Uh, you should have clean labor units to deliver babies and aseptic techniques should be 
uh, used for, del for delivering of babies. Avoid prolonged rupture of membranes. So once the membranes rupture, rather than keeping the mother unnecessarily without delivering the baby, it's ideal to deliver the baby before the rupture of membranes, membranes become prolonged. And maternal antibiotics when prolonged rupture of membranes detected or chorioamnitis is suspected. Hand hygiene is very important. Simple hand washing before handling newborns can prevent up to 50% of acquired neonatal sepsis. Aseptic non-touch technique, ANTT. So when doing procedures such as cannulation, umbilical vein, catheter insertion, you can use sterile gloves and clothes to cover all key areas and prevent pathogens entering the site. And minimum handling of key areas and instruments with sterile gauze will prevent germs entering the body during the tech, during these procedures. Then sometimes if the risk factors are identified, you can always use prophylactic antibiotics. Remove unnecessary cannula catheters and change long term catheters at appropriate intervals. Usually in a newborn we keep the cannula up to about 3 to 5 days. Once the duration is over, we always replace with another cannula because if you unnecessarily keep a cannula or a catheter in a newborn, that will become a port of entry for organisms, especially the skin organisms. And skin organisms can sometimes, one as long as they are living on the skin, are harmless to the baby. But once they enter the uh, bloodstream, they can be very dangerous. One common Harmless skin organism is strep epidermidis, but once it enters the bloodstream, it can cause serious sepsis. <coughs> so this is how minimally invasive non-touch technique uh, is used for cannulation procedures. You can see that during this cannulation, everything, all the unnecessary areas are covered. Only the necessary area is exposed. This person is inserting a catheter using ultrasound uh, machine, ultrasound probe, ultrasound guided catheter uh, insertion. And you can see that even the ultrasound probe is covered with a sterile covering. The person is wearing sterile gloves. He is wearing a sterile apron. So there is minimum chance for a uh, pathogen to enter the bloodstream through this cannulation and even when you are changing when the nurse is changing grips she is wearing a mask wearing sterile gloves so all these areas connect to the baby is minimally touched or minimally exposed to pathogens then finally intrapartum care mothers with a past history of group b strep affected baby or a group B streptococcus bacteriuria at any trimester during the current pregnancy or a high vaginal rec or rectal swab positive for GBS in late gestation in the current pregnancy. Now if there is a mother who fulfill either one or more of these criteria, IV benzyl penicillin is started at the onset of labor and it should be given 4 hourly till the baby is delivered. So by giving intrapartum antibiotics to the mother, we are trying to prevent GBS related sepsis occurring in the newborn. If there is a preterm pre-labor rupture of membranes, sometimes mothers will have rupture of membranes before going into labor and before the baby uh, enters 37 weeks of gestation. So it's called preterm pre-labor rupture of membranes. In this situation, first you check the mother's GBS status. If the mother is positive for GBS, then even if the baby is preterm, you plan for early delivery with intrapartum antib antibiotics. We are not unnecessarily delaying the delivery. We try to go for an early delivery. If the mother is negative for group B streptococcus, then IV or oral antibiotics to mother can be given and we plan delivery around 35 to 36 weeks of age. For example, if a 32-week uh, 
goes uh, mother who is on her 32nd week of gestation goes into preterm pre labor rupture of membranes and if the mother is negative for group b streptococcus then it is better to give antibiotics to mother and try to continue the pregnancy until around 35 to 36 weeks of age because if you deliver early yes you might prevent neonatal sepsis but then the baby is delivered at 32 weeks and prematurity related problems will be sometimes more harmful than the neonatal sepsis which can occur due to the preterm pre labor rupture. So you have to always weigh what is better for the child. If the mother is positive for GBS then rather than keeping the baby in an environment full of group based streptococcus then even if the baby is premature it is better to deliver early. So with that we come to the end of this lecture. In summary, neonatal sepsis have high mortality and morbidity. Signs and symptoms are very non-specific and sometimes very subtle. The etiology and clinical presentation differs from an older child. Not only the etiology and clinical presentation but even the lab reports are different from that of an older child. Early antibiotics are very important to prevent mortality and morbidity, but at the same time antibiotic overuse need to be prevented and prevention of sepsis take much higher priority than cure of sepsis. Thank you. So if you have any questions, you can email it to me at this email address pat.desa at gmail.com and whenever I am free, I will always reply it. Uh, and there will be a lecture note which I will upload to the Moodle and the lecture note will be a partially filled lecture note so that you can go through the lecture and complete the lecture note. Whenever you ask a question I will give you the answer and at the same time I will upload the question and answer under each lecture so that others also can go through because sometimes students ask wonderful questions and I. Uh, it's uh, unfair for only for that student to know the answer. It's better that the whole batch also know it. But don't worry, I will not uh, write the name of the student who have questioned me. It will be only the question and the answer. Thank you.